Okay, I want to do a, a book review here of probably one of the most idiotic books I've ever seen in my life. I mean, this thing here, it's by Dr. Phil Stringer. And this guy is supposed to be King James only, but he believes the Textus Receptus is superior to the King James. And therefore, he attacks those that say the King James is superior to the Textus Receptus and that the King James is all you need. You know, people like Gail Ripplinger. And there's an awful lot of attacks on Gail Ripplinger, by the way, out there, and, and a lot of them are just absurd. And this is probably at the top of the list of absurd attacks on Gail Ripplinger. This guy is a wacko, and I'm going to prove it today. But I want to start out here with the front cover. What's the deal here? King James Version in flames? Now, I guess he's trying to say that she's attacking the King James Version, and yet... Gail Ripplinger defends the King James Version. Gail Ripplinger never advocated burning a King James Version. You know, if anything, she's attacked because she holds it in too high regard. So who's really behind this thing of burning the King James Version? Well, I believe it's this guy right here. You see, Dr. Phil Stringer and other scholars like him don't like the idea of the laity having a Bible that can judge them. They want that priest class, that that authority over the people. That's what's going on. So, here he has, and this guy's got this Baptist uh, persecution complex. He thinks that the whole world revolves around the Baptist denomination, which is absurd. There's no Baptist denomination in Scripture. But we're going to see some of the idiotic attacks of this man. Her endless attacks against independent Baptist preachers. Huh? Huh? Uh, she attacks the new versions, not independent Baptist preachers. And I love this. Dedication to all the true friends of the King James Bible. This guy doesn't advocate the King James Bible. He advocates the Texas Receptus. Ridiculous. Then it goes in here to the... It goes in here to the preface. Um, page 8. Be careful of new claims. And there he talks about be extremely careful of anyone who claims they are revealing a mystery. Let's look at some scriptures. Mark chapter 4 verse 11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables. Romans chapter 11 verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Romans, cha Romans chapter 16, verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Ephesians 3, 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3, 16, And without controversy, controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And I only read a couple of them there. There's a whole bunch of them. Okay? The word mystery is a Bible word. Now what this guy, this isn't Dr. Phil Stringer here in the introduction, but what he's trying to prove is that somehow, because Gail Ripplinger says, you know, look, there's some, this the hidden language of the King James Bible. Isn't it amazing how English has cognitive scaffolding and everything where you can figure out the definition of the word by how it's put together? And I mean, She really has some incredible information. And because of that, he says, well, see, then that's, that's some kind of a cult type of a thing or some kind of evil or... No, it isn't. No, it isn't. That's ridiculous. But let me show you another thing here. Uh, he quotes part of a verse in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1.9. There is no new thing under the sun. Now, you're to believe by that, that you know, the King James Bible or no th thing that's revealed from the King James Bible, that, that can't be, you know, new and it can't be from God because it's something that just, you know, was shown. That's what he wants you to believe. 
But the problem is, when you start going back to get doctrine out of the book of Ecclesiastes, it always leads to heresy. You've got to be careful of that. What Solomon was saying there in Ecclesiastes was not that there's nothing ever new. Anybody could disprove that. That would make the Bible look silly. What he's trying to say is there's no new thing in the sense of uh, an automobile might be new, but it's just another form of, of transportation. Okay? A cell phone is new. You know, they're coming out with new ones all the time, but it's just another form of communication. See? So you might have new things, but those things have already been done in the past. That's what Solomon is, is saying. Now, let me ask you a question. The English language, is it new compared to the Bible? You know, the Bible languages of Greek and Hebrew there in the past? Yeah, obviously. Is English superior in some ways? Yes, it is. English is a superior language to coin Greek or coin A, however you want to say that. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, look here at page 9. Uh, he talks about Irving Robinson reports that a prime characteristic of cult-like activity is boasting of acceptance of Bible authority. These cults have their own writings that are interpretive of the Bible and actually supersede it in ultimate authority. I had to laugh at that one because, you see, the independent fundamental Baptists oftentimes will supersede the authority of Scripture with their traditions. Oh, that's heresy. How could you speak against the independent Baptists? How about church buildings? Could you show me some church buildings in Scripture? How about Baptist temples? Could you show me that in Scripture? I'll show you in Acts chapter 7 where it says, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And yet you'll see these Baptist temples, these huge, big, multi-million dollar buildings, and they say, Come here to meet God. I feel God's presence here. We're in the house of God, brother. No, you're not. Okay? There is no scripture for that. None. Your body is the temple. You are supposed to be in church 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Not every time the doors are open. See? Baptist tradition. And it supersedes the authority of scripture. Now, does that mean that they're heretical and some kind of satanic cult? No, absolutely not. I don't say that. But what I'm saying is, this nonsense of him holding up, you know, attacking Gail Ripplinger and things because she shows amazing things that appear in your King James Bible that didn't appear in Greek, and then saying, she's evil and horrible, but then they turn around and defend Baptist traditions. You know, Sunday best, you know, things like that. I mean, there are some guys that say you shouldn't have facial hair. I've, I've I had that put on me from independent fundamental Baptists. Chapter and verse? Of course not. They don't have any scripture for that, other than stuff that they twist. Traditions of men. That's all it is. And yeah, I'm going to get heated in this study. Deal with it. <laughs> Page 9. says here, They adhere uh, to doctrines which are pointedly contradictory to Orthodox Christianity. Again, he's trying to prove that Gail Ripplinger is a cult because, you know, she's the head of some kind of cult or something because she's saying things that are contradictory to Orthodox Christianity. And again, that's not Phil Stringer, it's this guy that's right in the introduction. How is exalting this book, how is that contradictory to Orthodox Christianity? It's a stupid argument. Really, really stupid. Okay, here we go on to the next one. Uh, it says here, in light of the paradigm shift in thinking proffered by Mrs. Ripplinger about letters in the King James Bible and English translation. Then he goes down here, uh, Ripplinger's writings are about justifying her unorthodox heretical ideology regarding the inspiration of translations, especially the King James Bible. Um, I'd like to point out there are inspired translations in what the, you know, what we call the original autographs. Paul on the road to Damascus, he has, you know, Jesus speaks to him in the Hebrew tongue. That was an inspired translation. It wasn't written in Hebrew, it was written in Greek. 
See, and this is this is Alexandrian terminology here. This kind of stuff right here. Oh, it's just a translation. The King James Bible is just a translation. They cast doubt onto the Bible so that you have to come to them, the Greek and Hebrew scholars, to have the Bible interpreted for you. Why? They can make more money off of you. Haven't you figured that out yet? They can get you into their church building and preach to you because you're just an ignorant laity, you know, and Dr. Smarty Pants up there, you know, behind the pulpit. Well, he's, he's all oh, brother so-and-so. He knows the Bible. You know, I don't dare try to interpret the Bible for myself. It's Catholicism. The priesthood over the laity. That's all that is. You won't find that teaching in Scripture. And then, of course, they get you into their seminary, which has no basis in Scripture. None. You don't see any seminaries or Bible colleges in there. You won't find it. What was that about a cult? Raising up their traditions above Scripture? Hmm. Interesting. Now let's look here down at the bottom of page 11. A pastor must give account for what, for they watch for your souls. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17. But the real Hebrews 13 17 says, Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Um... I didn't happen to see the word pastor in that verse. You know why? Because it's not in there. And this guy, H.D. Williams, is trying to deceive his reader. See, he puts up in here, pastor must give an account. It doesn't say that. It says obey them. Them, not pastor. So, oh, an independent fundamental Baptist wouldn't change scripture to prove their argument, would they? Oh, no, no. They would never, never attempt something like that. Next page, page 12. Unorthodox ideologies among those in the emerging ecumenical movement. That's what he's saying here about Gail Ripplinger's book. So now Gail Ripplinger, her books over here, this is somehow leaning towards the evangelical or the uh, uh, ecumenical emerging movement. Give me a break. I mean, you, you talk about an absurd attack. It's adolescent to say that Gail Rippling, I mean, he's like a little kid, you know, oh, she's leading towards the ecumenical movement. How? By turning people to the King James Bible, the perfection of the King James Bible? Page 13. Here he quotes the thing about, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. You know, and then he talks about good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Again, how is Gail Ripplinger deceiving people? How is she saying, you know, turning you away, you know, following that, not that which is evil, but that which is good? How is this evil? How is defending the King James Bible and exalting the King James Bible, how, is it, how does that lead to evil? I fail to understand that. Now we're going to go on to Silly Philly Stringer. Page 15. Occult Connections. Mandated Research. And then he has King James Bible Believing Preachers. She slanders and threats against independent Baptist King James Bible Believing Preachers. Um, no she doesn't. And this knucklehead here is attacking her because she is a King James Bible Believer. You see, if this book here is God's Word, then it has to be perfect. Word perfect. If there are errors in it, if it has mistaken translations and poorly translated, then it's not God's Word. See? That's the whole issue here. And that's what scares these little scholars, scholar wannabes like Stringer here. That's what scares them. Because if you have God's Word in your hand, you don't need people like Him. You don't need to pay His salary. You don't need to go to His seminary. That scares Him to death. An informed laity that can point out their errors because they have a final authority, a perfect final authority, scares people like this to death. So He'll act like He's a King James Bible-believing preacher. He isn't for one second. And I've talked to His kind for years now. Out in the pulpit, it's... The Word of God says 
dearly beloved. And behind the pulpit, behind closed doors, they'll rip this book to shreds. They don't believe it. They'll say it's, it's falsely translated here, it's falsely translated there, this isn't right, this should be translated differently. That's what they'll do. This guy is a liar. Page 16. He says, In all of thy word is a combination of computational linguistics with the occult dark arts of the Kabbalah. <laughs> yeah. Woo, yeah, you proved that point. The dark arts of the Kabbalah? And we haven't even scratched the surface yet. You aren't going to believe the mental gymnastics that this nut tries to pull off. And I'll tell you what, I feel bad. You are mentally challenged if you believe this propaganda. All right? Either very, very much deceived by this nut, or you have some, got some mental problems. I mean, the Kabbalah in Gail Ripplinger's work. Yeah. Okay. Continuing on, page 18. I'm going to try to get through this thing as quickly as possible. I don't want to waste too much time on Silly Philly. But uh, it says here, Their power, prestige, and income depended on fooling the people to whom they preach. Talking about uh, people here, the, you know, the Jews, the apostate Jews. But it's kind of interesting here because he actually reveals his own sins. <laughs> kind of funny. They mocked the God that they publicly professed to serve. They were responsible for the people turning gradually to the paganism that they publicly opposed but secretly practiced. Now, Dr. Sam Gipp has a real good uh, way that he interprets things. Okay, He said there are not, there's not one Bible, there are two. And there's not one Bible philosophy, there are two. And there are people that have an anti Antioch, which is where your King James Bible traces from, Antioch, Antioch mentality as well as an Antioch Bible. The Antioch mentality is believing what you hold in your hands is God's Word. That's what it is. So I have the right Bible and I have the right philosophy because I believe this is God's book for the English-speaking English world. Okay? But then you have people that have the Alexandrian, the Alexandrian Bible, and the Alexandrian philosophy. See, the Alexandrian philosophy is, this is not God's word. It can be improved upon, and we should improve upon it as often as, you know, we need more money, essentially. I mean, that's really what's behind it. Let's get real. So I have the wrong Bible and the wrong philosophy. Now, 15, well, it's more than 15 years ago now. Quite a few years ago, this was the Bible that I carried. This was given to me when I was 10 years old. You've probably heard that before if you've seen my other videos. I had the wrong Bible, but if you would have said to me back then, do you believe that this book is God's perfect word without error? I would have said yes. You know why? Because I believe by faith that it was God's word. I believe that God was able to preserve a book and give it to me in my language. And see, I wouldn't call this book God's word and then turn around and question it. That's Alexandrian philosophy. So you see, I had an Alexandrian Bible, but an Antioch mentality. And when a brother came along, Dr. Ken Hoven came along and said, there are problems with this, but this one here is the perfect word of God. I dropped my Alexandrian Bible, and I got my Antioch Bible with my Antioch philosophy. But now, that works another way, too. You see, there are people, I won't mention any names, who have the right Bible, he'll preach out of the King James Bible, he acts like he defends it, but he has an Alexandrian philosophy. He does not believe that this book is perfect. And Phil Stringer, if you're watching this, let me ask you something. What is the perfect word of God? Perfect without error. And you say, well, it's the Texas Receptus. Okay, why don't you preach from it? Stand up in your pulpit and preach from the Texas Receptus. No translation. Translations cannot be inspired. Just stand up there and preach from your Greek. See how much, you know, fruit comes from your ministry when you do that. No, you preach out of the King James Bible and you make your living from the King James Bible. You are a lying hypocrite. That's what you are. And this kind of nonsense right here is not orthodox. 
you're scared because a woman comes out that has more guts than you do, and she exposes the lies in the new versions, and she's more popular than you are. And that bothers you. Yep. Continuing. Page 22. I strongly suspect that, and he says Gar, Gail, you know, Ripplinger there, I can't remember what her middle name is, um, but I strongly suggest or suspect that Gar is a practitioner of the occult who has infiltrated independent Baptist circles. This book will present the evidence, or that evidence. Yeah. All this book is going to do is make you look even more stupid than you already are. And I'm going to be really, really rough with Stringer because this guy is a liar to the extreme. You aren't going to believe the stuff that this guy pulls off. Page 23. Thomas Edison and Theosophy. She provides a picture of a copy of his membership card in Theosophy. She does not mention that Thomas Edison denied being a member of, the, of Theosophy. Oh, come on. Okay, here's what you can do. Go to the Masonic Lodge's website or, you know, look and, and type in, you know, Ask them a question. Are you guys uh, Satanists? Are you worshiping Lucifer? You know what they'll say? They'll say, of course not. <laughs> what do you think they're going to say? Yes, we do worship Lucifer. Of course, I mean, it's ridiculous. You think he's going to admit to being a member of Theosophy? You see, occult means hidden. And these guys that are part of occult secret societies, they don't come out publicly and say, yes, I'm a member of Theosophy. I worship the devil. They don't do that. But Thomas Edison was an evil man. He wasn't a good man. But it's interesting, he'll attack Gail Ripplinger and defend a lost man like Thomas Edison. Weird. But then look down here, I love this. But no one should accuse him of making a deal with the devil without some clear evidence. And yet over here, he says that she's a practitioner of the occult. A Christian woman. You need clear evidence. Yeah. Okay. Page 26. The King James Code and Michael Hoggard. Pastor Michael Hoggard has written two books about the King James Code. He seems to be a good man. Who holds to a number of sound Orthodox Bible doctrines. However, Hoggard defines the King James Code this way. And he goes into saying about it here. Pastor Hoggard states that the Lord revealed this to him. This whole thing there about the numerical system in the Bible, which is there. It's right there. And how the Bible is such an intricately designed book. And I mean the King James Bible. It's, it's just an amazing book. So, not only does he attack Gail Ripplinger, he also attacks Mike Hoggard. If you defend the King James Bible and say this is the only book that you need, he's going to attack you. You know? And I'm going to talk more about the thing of God revealing things to people in just a little bit. Uh, what if the one who said yes to Hoggard wasn't really the Lord? What if he imagined this divine yes? If this account is true, the King James Bible is not the final authority. Yeah. Many of the people that are talking the loudest about the inspiration of the King James Bible are doing the most to undermine the authority of the King James Bible. Huh? Huh? Okay, a little double speak going on there. You know, yeah, if you're defending the King James Bible, you're attacking the King James Bible. Wow. Boy, that's deep. What a philosopher. It's kind of interesting, too, because, you know, he's attacking Gail Ripplinger and Mike Hoggard for, you know, having other things other than the King James Bible, and yet. He teaches at a seminary, unbiblical, and he writes and sells books. Well, isn't the Bible enough, you know? See, just, it's insanity, okay? And by the way, let me just say this before I continue, and I'm going to hit this a little bit more as we go on. When God reveals something to somebody, you know, he, I mean, he's kind of a, one of these secular type of people that, that in their minds they think that all... Revelation ended in the first century. Now I'll say that about the Bible. Yeah, sure. 
I don't believe that there should be any other books to the Bible. But can God reveal something to you today? Yeah. Absolutely. But it'll go right back to this book. It has to be in line with Scripture. Somebody comes out and they say, I believe such and such. Is it in the Bible? If it is, well then there's a good chance God revealed it to them. You check them out with Scripture. You're like a Berean. You search the Scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Obviously. You know? But let me just say this. Let's say, what if God actually did give Gail Ripplinger all this information? Should she say, I'm the one who created this. It's mine. I came up with it all myself. God didn't help me. No. Obviously not. So when, But when she says, you know, the Lord revealed this to me, it's, oh, it's some kind of heresy or something. You know why? Because a lot of these guys, like him, all they do is they learn the fundamentals of the faith, you know, and the Baptist traditions and things like that, and that's all they, they do. They just write prepared sermons. Just It's just dry and boring and dull. That's why. Uh, let's continue. Page 29. Most of these people do not know, you know, bewitched believers. I guess I'm one of them. Um, most of these people do not know that Gail Ripplinger has an occult background. She claims to have been saved out of transcendental meditation or that uh, she bases much of her the theology on occult textbooks. Okay. Uh, apparently, I guess, Phil here doesn't have any sin in his past. You know, apparently he just has lived a sinless, you know, immaculate conception of Phil Stringer or something like that. You know, apparently he's been sinless. So you go and you dig up dirt from somebody's past life and you, you throw that in their face. Real good thing to do there, buddy. Real smart. Just absurd. But now let's go to page 43. And believe me, I could I could go page after page after page in this thing. It's just the most idiotic thing I've ever read. I mean, I've read stuff from the Alexandrian cult that's more scholarly than this. Page 43. However, she has a she is obsessed with viciously attacking every born-again Christian that uses Greek or Hebrew. If Ripplinger and Seitler are right, then neither the King James Bible or any other Bible is our sole authority. Huh? If Ripplinger and Seitler are correct, then Gail Ripplinger is our final authority. Dr. Seitler and Dr. Ripplinger are offering extra biblical revelations. Yeah. Let me tell you something. There's not one person out there that's going to read Gail Ripplinger's material or Dr. James Seitler's material and come out worshiping them. They're going to come out believing this book, being encouraged and strengthened in the faith, and they're going to read it and they're going to believe it. This guy's a nut. All right? But uh, she, he says here that uh, she is obsessed with viciously attacking every born-again Christian that uses Greek or Hebrew. Again, nonsense. And it's interesting because I have, uh, let's see if I can find it here quick, right there. The Trinitarian Bible Society, Holy Bible, the Holy Scriptures in the original languages, languages, the Hebrew, there, and the Greek, there, the Texas Receptus. Isn't it kind of weird for a, a woman that attacks Greek and Hebrew to sell this? That's right. This came from AV Publications. I bought this from Gail Ripplinger's ministry. But see, Phil Stringer doesn't tell his reader that. He doesn't tell you that in this nonsense book. Page 51. I'm sorry, we're going to go to page 49. Bible Christianity does not offer any secret or hidden knowledge. Everything is plain, clear, and open in the Bible. God's truth is available to any believer who simply accepts what the Bible teaches. Okay. Let me say it one more time. What is the Bible? This? Or this? God's teachings are plain in the Bible. You mean this one? Hebrew and Greek? How many people could read this? How many people could get saved out of this? This is the book. 
right here. And yet, he'll make little statements like that, just like the Alexandrian hypocrites will do. They'll say, the Bible is God's Word. And you say, what is the Bible? What is the perfect Bible? They don't have a book like that. But they'll lie to you, they'll deceive you, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, you know, as the Bible warns about. They'll lie to you, and you'll believe them that they're Bible believers, and they're not. They have no perfect Bible that they can hold in their hands. All right, now we're going to get to some fun stuff here. This is really good. Now, are you ready? Here we go. Now, now this is going to be kind of scary, so get ready. Okay, you ready? The solar logos, a prominent occult symbol. <gasps> the cover features a beachfront sunset. There is no similar picture on the cover of any other theology or any other theology book that I possess. You ready? I hope I don't give you nightmares here, people. This is really scary. <gasps> oh no! Oh, a sunset! Oh! Oh, isn't that horrible? Oh, a sunset! I'll take it away so you don't have nightmares. It turns out that the image of the sun is a major occult symbol, the solar logos. And he goes on to, to, to try and prove that this somehow shows that Gail Ripplinger is uh, practicing the Kabbalah and all kinds of other stuff here because she puts a sun on the front of in all of thy word. You're dealing with somebody here whose mind is leaving them. Their sanity is almost gone. Page 53. Oh, it gets worse. Page 53. Here we go again. The Mobius and other occult symbols. The Mobius also called the... And he, the guy doesn't even know how to spell it. It's Triketra. But of course, you know, documentation and facts don't seem to bother Stringer here. Historically, the Mobius has been used by churches as a symbol of the Trinity. So he's actually defending it? You see? You see what's going on here? So why does Gail Ripplinger use the Mobius on the cover of hazardous material? It's also, materials. It's also on the spine. She must be laughing at her followers. You ready? Hazardous materials. There is what he's calling the trichatra, the Mobius. And it's also on the spine. Oh, up here. Right there. Um, silly filly. That's called a hazardous materials symbol. Okay? Go to Google and type in biohazard symbol. Like right here. Look at all the biohazard symbols. And then compare them to this one. You see, biohazard symbol goes with hazardous materials. <laughs> I know that's really difficult to understand. You know. Continuing on. The Fleur de Lis. The Fleur de Lis is a famous symbol of antiquity. It has, been several, it has been given several meanings in different forms. In some places, it is a symbol of immortality, or immorality, I'm sorry, and in others, it is an occult symbol. It has other meanings. Why does Gail Ripplinger slip two tiny Fleur de Lis on the back cover of In All of Thy Word? Oh no, she's doing it again. Oh, this is horrible. What's he talking about? Right there. He says that's a Fleur de Lis. I guess I'm pronouncing that right. Right there. What does an actual Fleur de Lis look like? Let's go to Google and type in Fleur de Lis in Google Images. And look what it comes up with. That symbol there is obviously not the same symbol as appears here on the back of an All of Thy Word. It's not even close. <laughs> not even remotely close. But truth and documentation don't seem to bother this guy. But it doesn't end there. 
I mean, the, the mental gymnastics here are just incredible. Page 54, the red string. According to the website KabbalahTalisman.com, the red string is an essential symbol for Kabbalah and is used by every true Kabbalist and is a very powerful magical force. Okay, you can see here in Google Images again, Michelle Jackson, the alien freak that he was, uh, Michael Jackson, he's wearing one around his wrist, and over there you have the satanic slut Madonna, she's wearing one around her wrist. And Madonna is a Satanist, by the way, too. Don't be deceived. And she practices the Kabbalah. She's written children's books about the Kabbalah. I mean, she is a very wicked, vile, filthy tramp. But now, let's continue reading here in Silly, Strip, Silly Philly's book. Gail Ripplinger's book, In All Thy Word, has a red string book marker. When is the last time you saw a theology book with such a book marker? It is impossible that Gail Ripplinger does not know that this is an occult symbol that she is using in a book that teaches Christians to practice the occult. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Wait, are you ready? I don't want to give you nightmares again here. I mean, I'm sorry to keep showing you this scary stuff. You ready? You can, you know, close your eyes if you if you're afraid of things like this. Ready? Here it is. <gasps> oh, oh, oh. Oh, isn't that frightening? Oh, I mean, here, I'll, I'll take the whole thing out. Oh, look at a red ribbon marker. Oh, isn't that horrible? Oh, he's never seen a theology book with such a marker. Holy Bible, King James Version. Oh, no. A red ribbon marker. Oh. I think Gail must have gone back in time to the 1970s when this book was printed. This Bible was printed here. This King James Bible. I can show you inside there. It's King James Bible. The National Bible Press in Philadelphia. Gail Ripplinger must have gone back in time. Back to when this thing was printed. And she, as a symbol to other... Kabbalists out there, she put in a red ribbon marker. Oh, isn't that horrible? Oh, that's just so frightening, isn't it? And by the way, Silly Philly here is part of the uh, Trinitarian Bible Society. Did you know that they put out a Bible with red ribbon markers? Do you reckon that the, the uh, Trinitarian Bible Society are practicing Kabbalists? You see, what we're dealing with here, we're dealing with a man that is absolutely jealous, apparently, of Gail Ripplinger's, you know, being blessed of the Lord. He's absolutely just seething in jealousy that a woman could actually, you know, affect more change than him. And so he's grasping at whatever he can. This isn't proof of anything. And how is Gail Ripplinger, you know, she teaches Christians to practice the occult. By believing the King James Bible? Page 55. Continuing on. Another reason that I suspect that Gail Ripplinger is a practitioner of the occult is that she claims to hear supernatural voices. Okay. Well, if that's your standard for determining if somebody's in the occult, then apparently everybody in the Bible also was a practitioner of the occult. When the Lord spoke to him, I guess that was some kind of an occult thing there. It's insane. Going on, page 59. Gail Ripplinger's claims to supernatural revelation and her claims that anyone who opposes her cannot be saved place her in the same category as these other false teachers. Um, see, I gotta explain something to you. Um, you see, Phil Stringer here, he's a scholar. He's an independent fundamental Baptist scholar, and you can trust everything that he says and writes. See, and now, when he makes a statement like that, he'll provide the documentation. So let's look at that again here. We're gonna look at the footnote where this documentation came from. Um... Huh. 
You mean he would make an absurd claim and not be able to prove it? Saying that Gail Ripplinger uh, says that you, you have to believe in her to be saved? Yeah. You see what that's called is slander. Lying. That's what that's called. Page 61. Personality profile. There's yet another reason why I think that Gail Ripplinger is a con conscious practitioner of the black arts. <laughs> well, I, I can't tell, you know, maybe she paints, you know, black, you know, paint occasionally. That would be the black arts there. That's about all the black arts you're going to, you know, see from Gail Ripplinger. I mean, that, this guy is a nut. Back to what he's saying here. Um, this reason, I will admit, is somewhat subjective. No, come on. Phil Stringer being subjective. There is a certain type of personality that always has to accuse other people of what they are doing. You mean kind of like what he's been doing the whole way through this book? Without any documentation? Yeah. Page 63, here we have the response to messianic claims. One of the main accusations was that I was not saved. Actually, this was very helpful. In Messianic Claims, I made the point that Gail Ripplinger was making herself part of the gospel. If you didn't have the right relationship with Gail Ripplinger, you couldn't be saved. Nothing could be more cultic than this teaching. When is the last time an independent Baptist accused someone of being unsaved because they disagreed with them? This guy writes things, contradicts himself right in the same paragraph. He just is saying all throughout this book that Gail Ripplinger is a practitioner of the occult. She's not saved. Why? Because she doesn't agree with Phil Stringer. And then he comes here and he says, when's the last time an independent Baptist accused someone of being unsaved because they disagreed with them? You're doing it all through this book, you knucklehead. I mean, give me a break. I mean, you talk about a lying hypocrite here. I have more respect for some of the Alexandrian, the def defenders of the new versions, than I do for this guy. This guy is, he is out of it. Page 64. The modus operandi. Gail Ripplinger and her drones. <laughs> I guess I'm a drone now, too. Uh, have also made many serious personal accusations against me. Yeah, get ready, there's more coming. Of course, they have not offered one shred of evidence. Evidence is not important in Ripplinger world. They haven't offered a shred of evidence for one reason. All of their accusations are lies, and they know it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sure that this new book will result in many new, wild, false, and improper, and unprovable accusations that that is uh, how Ripplingerites work. Oh, now I'm a Ripplingerite. You know, kind of like Ruckmanite, you know? That's the mentality of these people. Okay, you want proof? Right there. Proof number one. You lied, Phil Stringer, when you said that this is the Mobius, the Trichetra. It's hazardous materials. Biohazard symbol. It's an internationally recognized symbol. It's biohazard. It's not a Trichetra. You lied, number one. Number two. You have an absurd statement there that the sunset is somehow her worshipping the sun. That's idiotic, okay? A symbol or a picture of a sunset is not proof of sun worship. You lied again. How about the red ribbon marker? Right here. King James Bible with a red ribbon marker. You lied again. You said these are Fleur de Lis on the back. They are not. You lied again. Four times I documented that you are a liar. Four times. Oh, but Gail Ripplinger's followers, her drones... Well, what Christian love? Her drones, you know, they can't prove anything. You know, not one shred of evidence. I just proved it. Four places you are a liar. Now let's continue. Page 65. Threats to sue. Here he goes on to talk about how Gail didn't want to put up with this anymore, and she said, okay, you know what? You people are lying about me. This is libel. This is slander. If you don't stop, I'm going to take you to court, and I'm going to sue you. And you say, oh, what an, un what an, what a, what an unchristian thing to do. Let me demonstrate how that would work, okay? 
Let's say I publicly come out and I say, Dr. Phil Stringer is an undercover Jesuit, a 33rd degree Mason, a cross-dressing sodomite that likes to molest children and drink human blood. Now, what if I said that and made that a public statement? Could that be used to tarnish the character of Dr. Phil Stringer? Yes, obviously. And I don't have any proof for any of that stuff. Okay? I can't prove that. I'm just saying it to make this point. You know, so don't try suing me or something. Okay? I'm trying to make a point here. I do not have a right to say those things publicly and then get away with it. Okay? And you don't have a right to lie about a woman who is saved, a sister in Christ, if you're, if you're saved, Stringer. You don't have a right to lie about her and try to destroy her character. And there's only so much that a Christian is supposed to put up with. We are not just supposed to just let people just destroy us and... and and, I mean, come on. How much personal attack are you supposed to put up with? That's all she's doing. She's just saying, hey, back off a little bit here. Page 67. I love this one. How about unreported quotes? <laughs> like uh, Stringer's been doing the whole way through this thing. She says this and she says that and she's, I proved this and I proved that. No footnotes. No proof. And he goes into a bunch of other things there. You know, we're not going to go through it. And it's funny because he actually goes into quotes from Tyndale and Wycliffe. And I'll show you here. You can slow this down and, and look at it if you want. Where are the footnotes at? Again. Where are the footnotes? He says, the unreported quotes. Okay. Here he actually does quote one. See? And he says, you know, uh, the teachers of Greek are full... Where are we at here? Gail Ripplinger is famous for her misquotes. There's no, no one like her. In the hidden history of the English scriptures, she quotes. Okay, so he's actually saying she quotes him. And he says, in actuality, Frode did not say that. Christian said that. He said that blah, 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 blah. So actually, I messed up there for a minute. Sorry about that. This is Gail Ripplinger's quote. She provides a source. He says, no, they didn't actually say that. And he provides no source. Yeah. Page 69. Was the King James Bible originally given on the day of Pentecost? Down here, she says, your English Bible is traced from Acts 2 to you. Okay? Now, again, he leaves his readers with only part of the information. What Gail Ripplinger is saying in the act, with the Acts 2 argument is this teaching that the Hebrew and Greek are sacred and no translation can be inspired. You know, only the Greek and Hebrew are inspired. Okay. What about the other languages mentioned in Acts chapter 2? Were they inspired? You see, God was already busy translating His Word into other languages. And they were inspired languages in Acts chapter 2. No English was not available there. You don't, you're not going to read in Acts chapter 2. You're not going to read that they you know, spoke in English or something. No, it wasn't there. But the point is, it started there God saying, Okay, we're going to go to all the nations. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You can't do that just sticking to Greek and Hebrew. God's Word has to be translated, and it has to be translated accurately and correctly, which is what the King James Bible is all about. Don't ever believe, you know, some people try to put it on King James Bible believers that we say only the English is inspired. I don't believe that. That's nonsense. Okay? I say this is probably the best translation ever created. I will say that. This, I mean, why? Well, because of science. Science proves it. No Bible in history was printed like this book. No Bible in history has produced the spiritual fruit that this book has produced. That's scientific. I can prove that. I could prove that in a law of court if I had to. This is the greatest book on the planet. No book, no book in history has been printed and published like the King James Bible. That's why I defend it. That's why I support the King James Bible. 
But if I would, were to say that you have to learn English or something to have the whole Bible, I don't believe that. Okay, you can make a translation of the King James Bible. You can use the Texas Receptus and the Masoretic Hebrew. I don't have a problem with that. You know, and that's all she's trying to say there by the Acts 2 argument. Okay, if it's just only Greek and Hebrew, like Stringer and his cronies believe, then why was God using other languages in Acts chapter 2? Think about that. Think. Independent thought. I know that's scary to some of the seminary people out there. They want to create robots that come out of their seminaries. You know, and discourage independent thought. You have a test coming up soon and you have to, to fill it out according to what we tell you you're supposed to fill it out as. You know, don't think for yourself. That's dangerous. I actually had a guy say it to me the one time. A college educated, you know, Bible scholar. Independent thought is dangerous. That's what leads to cults. No, that's what leads to freedom. Continuing. Page 73. It all makes sense now. Ripplinger's hatred of the received text. Her hatred of the received text. Gail Ripplinger claims to be pro-King James Bible. She understands what happens if you destroy the foundation of the King James Bible. Her teachings will produce modernism in the next generation. Yeah. As I stated earlier, Texas Receptus, Masoretic Hebrew, I bought it from AV Publications. If she hates the Texas Receptus, why is she selling it? Why is she recommending it? And how in the world is belief in the King James Bible and, and understanding of this book, how is this going to lead to modernism? No. You see, Stringerism here, this Alexandrian philosophy, you use the right text, but in your mind you say, no Bible's inspired, no Bible's perfect, only the Greek, only the Hebrew, and we can change and rewrite and read it. That's what led to modernism. Attacking, undermining the authority of the King James Bible, started by Westcott and Hort. They were the, the two creeps that started this whole movement. And that led to modernism. Not defending the King James Bible. That doesn't lead to modernism. Again, another absurd, ridiculous statement that Stringer makes. Page 75. undermining of the King James Bible. Gail Replinger hides behind the King James Bible in order to undermine the King James Bible. She undermines the King James Bible in uh, both in doctrine and in practice. How? How on earth does she undermine the King James Bible? Let me show you something here quick. This book here and this book here are my very two first Bible or books defending the King James Bible. Sam Gipps' answer book and Gail Ripplinger's New Age Bible versions. And you know what happened to me when I was done reading both of these books? I was NIV. I used an NIV. I was a modern Christian. Modernism. That's what I was. And you know what these books did to me? They gave me a faith and an appreciation for this book right here, the King James Bible. They made me believe that I actually was holding the Word of God in my hands and that these new versions like my old NIV were of the devil and wicked. I saw that there were so many changes in how they lined up with the occult like Gail Ripplinger proves in her New Age Bible versions. And as I studied the occult, I knew stuff about that over the years, and it was like, yeah, you know what? These changes do line up with the occult uh, beliefs, essentially, and their goals of, of bringing in a new world order. You know, I've proved that in my videos here. There's a conspiracy behind these new versions. They're very wicked. These books did not make me unorthodox and a modern Christian. They did the exact opposite. But when you have a guy like... Silly Philly here, coming out and saying, you know, well, the, the King James Bible, it's a good translation, but it's not perfect. That leads to modernism. Because now you have to go out and you have to study Greek and Hebrew and you have to 
become a scholar. You know, kind of like the scribes, where Jesus said, "Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures." Continuing, page seventy-six. Gail Ripplinger has a rapidly shrinking base. I don't know how long it will be before her movement shrinks to the point where it is unimportant. Uh, quite the opposite is true. You see, though, the quote-unquote wild claims of Gail Ripplinger in the past, back when this book came out, New Age versions that shook up the body of Christ like crazy, people really, you know, this is a controversial book. Most of the Christian bookstores won't even sell it. They won't even think about selling it. They'll sell books that attack it, but they won't sell it. And when this book came out, she made a bunch of claims about the coming New World Order and the fact that the new versions have an agenda behind them, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And guess what? She's been vindicated. The new versions are getting worse. There is a New World Order coming very rapidly. Her work has been vindicated. Her movement and she's not the founder of the King James Only movement, by the way. It's been around for many, many years before she was even born. But that movement, the King James Bible believing movement, is going to go right out into the future. And it's interesting because Revelation chapter 6 9 says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now that is a future event that hasn't happened yet. These are tribulation saints that are slain for the word of God. Let me ask you a question. How many people, after the rapture takes place, how many people do you think are going to defend the Texas Receptus? These things are going to be laying on the shelf as junk. People are going to defend this book right here. This book is the only one that can accurately tell you what's coming in the future. All the other new versions have removed the issues about the mark of the beast being in the hand or in the forehead. This old, outdated King James Bible talks about implantable microchips, which I believe is part of the Mark of the Beast system. This old King James Bible brings out that truth, written 400 years ago. And you can go back to the original 1611, and it says, in the right hand, or in the forehead, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. This book is going to be vindicated, just like Gal Ripplinger's book. The movement's not going to diminish, it's going to grow. And you see, all these people that used to defend the NIV and they'd say, you know, the NIV is a good book, it's, it's orthodox and everything. Even a lot of NIV Christians are now starting to back off from the newest NIV because they see the feminist agenda. They see the political correctness of the modern versions. More and more and more proof is coming out against the new versions and King James but Bible belief is growing by leaps and bounds. I get letters you wouldn't believe the amount of, of incoming letters. People saying, I used to use new versions. I watched your videos. I've seen other things. I've linked to your articles and things. And I'm convinced the King James Bible is God's word. The movement is growing, not diminishing. I'm sorry, Philly. It's not going to diminish. It's not going to go away like you hope. And people like you are going to become outdated. People like you with your Greek and Hebrew are going to become outdated as time goes by. You're not going to be needed anymore. <clears throat> just about done here, folks. Sorry it's taking so long, but uh, just want to expose this nut. Page 86. Now this one here is interesting. Here he's talking about, you know, Gail Ripplinger. She uh, says that she hears voices and things. You know, that God presents things to her. Demons present themselves as gods, ghosts, ascended masters, and all this other stuff. And the Holy Spirit. Oh, really? Could you give me a chapter and verse where it says that demons present themselves as the Holy Spirit? See, the Bible says that demons, the devils, also believe and tremble. I don't recall hearing anywhere where the devils said that they are the Holy Spirit. That's a rather serious thing to say there. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 through 24. Who else made this claim about, Gail Ripplinger says, the Lord spoke to me, and he says, well, actually, that's probably a demon that was opposing as the Holy Spirit. 
Who else made that claim? Matthew 12, 22 says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Isn't it interesting that Phil Stringer is basically doing the same thing as the Pharisees of old did to Jesus Christ? Gail Ripplinger says, you know what? The Lord showed me the amazing complexity of the King James Bible. And friend, you can hold this book. You can believe it. You can trust it. And God, God revealed this stuff to me. God showed me that this is God's true word. And Phil Stringer sits back at the old Pharisee that he is, and he sits back and he goes, that wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was a devil that did it. It was a demon that did it. Hmm. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, if the Holy Spirit is speaking through Gail Ripplinger, and I believe he is, and I believe the Holy Spirit speaks through Brother Mike Hoggard as well, and Silly Philly here is saying that it's actually demon spirits. And you're, Phil there, you're, you're actually calling the Holy Spirit a demon. You better be careful. You better be real careful. Page 90. It's interesting too because, you know, He's, he's, a, I, uh, he's a King James Bible-believing pastor. Independent, fundamental Baptist, King James Bible-believing pastor. Then why are you using the term demon? Which is not a King James Bible word. The word is devil. Rather strange, isn't it? Page 90. The message of demons contains several constant false doctrines. Like the King James version of the Bible is especially untrustworthy. So in other words, he's saying that a devil, I'll use the real word, a devil will try to attack the King James Bible, try to get you to undermine the authority of the King James Bible. And yet that's exactly what he does. He even puts it on the front cover, the King James Bible, in flames. Think about it. You better be careful with these crazy cultic nuts like Stringer. He doesn't want to bring you liberty. He doesn't want to bring you freedom. He wants to bring you under bondage, under him. Page 118, Summary. Countless other examples could be provided. False religion comes from Satan and false spirits through willing false prophets unto the masses of men. It is an interesting here that he, and by the way, all these other places here, all these pages, he's using things where these lost people are basically saying God spoke to me and, and stuff like that. And he tries to equate that and compare it to Gail Ripplinger, saying God showed me the information in these books. He'll attack a saved woman and say that it's, it's demon spirits that are that are coming to her and, and deceiving her. He's a nut. But let me ask you a question there, silly filly. Who gives you your sermons when you preach? Is it your own intellect? Or is it the Lord? And why, if you say, oh, it's the Lord that gives me my sermons, okay, do you give him credit? Do you say the Lord showed me this? Or do you, if you do that, are you just lying to people? You see the kind of nonsense? Page 124. Now, you got to love this. Quotes John 8, 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay. What is the truth? I'm talking absolute, perfect truth that cannot be changed, that is inerrant, error-free, you know, just was what inerrant means. I have to, you know, define this stuff because these Alexandrians don't really understand it. What is the truth? You see, my King James Bible, John 17, 17, says... Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word 
is truth. You come to my ministry, Bible Believers Fellowship, King James Video Ministries, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to convince you that you can hold a book, that you can judge anything, including me. I have had brethren come to me and say to me, Hey, brother, I'm sorry, I've got to tell you something, you're wrong. And here's a verse that proves you're wrong. And I have admitted to it publicly to being proven wrong at times because I have a final authority, a higher authority than myself. And see, that's what scares these guys. Because they are scholars. They're up above everybody else. They're not laity. And how dare the laity come and try to question them and try to undermine their holy authority. You know? We're not dealing with Bible believers here in this book. We're not dealing with a man who wants to make you free in the Lord. We're dealing with a guy who wants to bring you under bondage. His bondage. The bondage of his church building. The bondage of his seminary where he teaches. That's what he wants. And I've talked to some of these seminary ed educated guys. They are some of the most arrogant, prideful people that you will ever meet. I've met too many humble ones. You push them far enough, then they will bring out their little college-educated, I'm higher than you thing. They'll bring that out real quick. Now let's compare here, in closing, let's compare the goals of Gail Ripplinger. Gail Ripplinger and her books right here. Let's talk about these books for a minute. What are her goals? Gail Ripplinger's goals are, you can read and you can trust the King James Bible. Alright? The Holy Spirit can lead and teach you. That's what's going on here with Gail Ripplinger. Gail Ripplinger is saying the King James Bible is not just a book that was written by men. It is a Holy Spirit inspired translation. It is a book that you can trust 100% with your life. You can judge other people with it. It's just an amazing book. That's what Gail Ripplinger wants to get across. What about the Dean Bergen Society, which Stringer here is a part of? What about that? Well, you can read the King James Bible, but the Texas Receptus can be used to overthrow it when you don't like the translation. You see something you don't like, you just go back to the Greek or the Hebrew, and you overthrow the English. That's what you do. So somebody comes up to you, some little redneck or something like that with a King James Bible, and he says, you know what, what you did there was wrong, and I can prove it from Scripture. You say, well, dear friend, actually, the Greek says. See? And if you, you, know, you go through Scripture and the Holy Spirit isn't giving you your sermons, you're just, you know, repeating, you're just a parrot, you know, repeating what you were taught in your seminary. And you go through, and you run into some kind of verse that's hard to understand, you know, and you're unstable and unlearned, so you rest the scriptures unto your own destruction. That's what they do. And what these guys really want, you need, is they want to get it into your head that you need the educated scholars to interpret the Word of God for you. That's what's going on here. A Bible-believing ministry is one that will hold up a book that you can believe and you can preach from and you can read for yourself and you can write. You know, certainly there is a thing of, an, of older men in the Lord understanding the Word of God better. You should listen to preachers. You should listen to good preaching. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But the fact of the matter is, when it comes right down to it, there's one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. Okay? Jesus Christ is really all you need. You don't need a scholar class up here that we laity can't attain unto. That's heresy. That's Roman Catholicism. God did not create a hierarchical system for the New Testament church. My job as a Bible-believing pastor is to train up those people who I have the oversight of as a pastor. I'm supposed to train you up so that you know what I know and you can go out and minister to other people. Become a preacher, become a pastor yourself someday. And you know, oh, you believe in female pastors. No, I don't believe in female pastors. Just did a sermon about that this past Sunday. So don't try to put that on me now. But this, if you're 
trying to follow this kind of nonsense here. I'm going to tell you right now, you're just going to remain in the congregation of the dead, as it says in the Bible. You wander out of the way of understanding, you're going to remain in the congregation of the dead. You're going to be put under some guy who's going to keep you down on the laity class. Even if you go through his seminary, he's going to try to keep you down. All right? Don't fall for this kind of nonsense. Don't believe the lunatic ravings of Dr. Phil Stringer. That's it.